Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with some more potential history. Uh, I know this is not the uh, Girls on Panzer Das Finale. Is that what it's called? Um, this is Pearl Harbor, the best bad option, Pacific Series Part 1. Um, yeah, I, I think I had enough of <laughs> Girls on Panzer for a bit. Uh, we'll get to it eventually. But I want to I wanna learn a little uh, about Pearl Harbor here. Um, because I've heard this before, and I think he's probably mentioned it in brief in previous videos when talking about the Pacific Front. Um, so I'm open, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious here, but I think, I think I know where he's going to go with it. Um, I'm not going, what the fuck? I think I know where he's going to go with it, um, but I'm not going to guess it because I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> Because that's how that works. Before I dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. The Kickstarter for my book has gone live. Yes, I will be saying this in every single fucking video. Get used to it for the next 30 days or really until it gets uh, funded. Um, go, go click the link in the description box below or in the pinned comment in the comment section to get an act to get... Uh, to click the link for the Kickstarter so that you can also have access to the plot synopsis the plan, where the money will be going, what I've, what my budget is, how I'm planning all this shit out, and um, for the free prologue and free first five chapters. Now, of course, I also want to reiterate, um, the first five chapters and the prologue are, of course, still susceptible to edits and being drastically changed if I feel like, uh, if I come up with a better way to tell what I want to tell in those chapters. So, those chapters are not the final product, but I do feel like I've gotten them to, uh, I've edited them, uh, edited, edited them enough to a point where I think they are at least a good representation of my capabilities as a writer and storyteller. So, yeah, let's go ahead and dive right in. It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Bad idea. Japanese troops leave for the conquest of Manchuria. Japan, the first of this war's aggressor nations, starting out a full 14 years ago on a career of international conquest and pillage. Bad idea. On December 7th, 1941, <laughs> Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and... Okay, you know what? I've decided I'm actually going to give out my guess for why this is the best bad option. It is because... Um, I think Japan, Japan did need to, for what its goals were and what it needed to do, right? It needed to invade the Philippines for its, for part of its plan to work. It needed a solid sphere of uncontested control in the region, right? So they could not avoid taking the American controlled islands. Uh, of the Pacific. They needed to take those for their defense, the, the plan that they had for the empire that they wanted. Um, and plus, it also makes sense in terms of a, a you know, strategic uh, defense, right? You don't want, you know, Philippines is pretty close to Japan uh, and other islands that the U.S. has. Kind of got to get rid of those because, you know, the USA could still, like, right? They, essentially, what I'm thinking potential history is here is going to say is that Japan... I believe Japan did need to strike first against the USA. At least in the hopes, because the only way you really get the USA out of war is if the war turns unpopular enough by the general public. They needed to try and they needed to do something that could scare the general public. Pearl Harbor is a good shot at it where it achieves both a, a hit on the US military and two, it will be publicized in American media. And of course, the gamble is it could either invigorate the Americans to fight or it could, you know, scare them. I, Japan didn't really have another option to go. It was, I, like, they needed to strike somewhere to try and at least cripple the USA for either scare them off to where the USA won't, will just back away, um, which of course is a low, um, unlikely thing, or two, 
cripple them long enough to set up a defensive perimeter and defenses on your gained islands so that you can then repel American attacks, right? I think I'm leaning more towards the second option there as being the reason why Japan decided to attack, uh, to attack Pearl Harbor, uh, going off of context information that I have. But let's see what Mr. Potential History has to say. Declared war afterwards. Bad idea. The Japanese invasion of the Philippines was conducted on schedule. The first landing was made on December 8th. And during the two weeks following, beachheads were successfully secured at six points in the archipelago. Good idea. Hmm. So this will be video one in a five video series that I am extremely excited for. In partnership with World of Warships, over the next few months I'm going to be covering the naval war in the Pacific, all the way from Pearl Harbor to the final surrender. For anybody who doesn't know, World of Warships is an online free-to-play naval combat simulator, where you can take command of ships that define naval combat once. in the 20th century, including some, actually pretty much all, I didn't of like the it. ships that will be discussed in the series, along with over War 200 games? other historical battleships, all or designed from 3D thing. scans of their real-life counterparts. The game is a great balance of strategy and action. I myself have been especially enjoying playing aircraft carriers, as they had a whole new dimension to the game. A Hosho aircraft carrier history ships of war when signing up and begin sailing today. So you've probably seen some iteration of this meme before, of the Axis powers early in World War II winning victory after victory, and then Japan screwing it all up by attacking the US fleet at Pearl Harbor, and bringing the United States into World War II as a huge game changer thwarting all hopes of an Axis. I mean, I understand, I understand how this happened though, uh, how this kind of thought, pro thought process came to be. Um, is uh the way i look at is just the timing of everything right in the same year that you know i mean of course uh, i think the russians were holding and starting to push the germans back before the pearl harbor bombing i can't remember the, the timeline there on the eastern front but like you know the usa gets involved japan bombs pearl harbor suddenly uh the africa war is starting to go uh poor uh the worse um the uh um the russians are holding on or, or even pushing back right um like the just the timing of it all is just so perfect that it lends itself to that meme this victory and while there are a lot of incorrect things to unpack in that sentence that are outside of the scope of this video the attack on pearl harbor is often boiled down to something that simple say that there is at least a chance that I didn't think this through completely. Just a big, dumb mistake with very little thought put into why. And given the outcome, yeah. I understand why it's presented that way. But to understand the war in the Pacific and the Japanese as a whole, something I plan to dedicate a lot of time. Yeah, I don't know. Like, that's the one thing that also bothers me about it when people do call Pearl Harbor a bad idea, um, is that, uh, the Japanese did put a lot of planning behind it, right? When going off of, I haven't watched really an attack on Pearl Harbor video in so long, so I'm very rusty on this information. But what I remember off the top of my head here from videos we've watched in the past on uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor and Japan's planning for it is Japan. Japan put a lot of thought into it. So I think. You know, I think they thought of the why. I think they were well aware of what was to come, um, and and but they deemed it a uh, the gamble worth it um, to at least try. Time to in this series, you need to understand the reasons that they started it and why these two countries came into conflict in the first place. The Second World War is obviously the lowest point for American-Japanese relations, but to see how it got to that point, you really need to see how they were before that. And in short, they <laughs> were never great. In the 1850s, the relationship started off on poor ground when Commodore Perry forced the isolated nation of Japan to open up its port to the world. Knock knock, it's the United States. Much to the chagrin of many Japanese living in a society still basically in the Middle Ages, who didn't really possess the technology to do anything about it with the American ship's guns trained on them. Hey. You're gonna open up the country or what? Japan, quickly taking this lesson to heart, modernized at the fastest pace any nation. Man, I fucking love the last, uh, the last samurai. Um, 
Is it a very probably historically poor movie? Yes. Is it a good time? Yes. Uh, and I, I, I gotta rewatch it. It's been a while, but I think they do a good job of um, showcasing. I, you know, well, I mean, of course, I'm saying this as a white man, so of course, uh, feel <laughs> you disagree. If you disagree with me, more than valid. Um, I feel like they did a pretty good job, especially for when the movie was made. Think of that in the context. When this movie was made, I feel like they did a good job of not uh, falling into the pit of white saviorism. It was it definitely still, um, he's still a bit white. Uh, Tom Cruise's character is still uh, a bit w pretty white savory uh, in just how much of a focal he is. But I can't remember the Japanese uh, Japanese American uh, actor's name. Was it was it Watanabe? Is that the last name of him? Can't remember. The guy that plays the actual last samurai, who the movie is technically about, and the struggle that the you know samurai are going through, and of course you know realistically you know the samurai weren't you know as they are portrayed in this movie, but. We love our ideals of chivalry, be it chivalry as it was in Eastern society or in Western society. Um, we love our ideals and stuff like that, our noble warriors, as we perceive the samurai. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought they did a good job of focusing it on uh, the USA is coming in and kind of it, 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 uh, a mix of the USA is coming in and is very much kind of strong arming the Japanese a bit into modernizing. Um, but also they did, I feel like they did a good job of showcasing like the internal, you know, again, for a early two thousands movie, I thought they did a good job here. Um, could have been better, but also like the action in the movie is also really good. I also really love, the moment where uh, Tom Cruise's character is just getting beat by the older samurai. Uh, that, that kind of moment is, I don't know, I like that. That was, that was a really like good, good, uh, good moment in the movie. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. The ever has, defeating the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War only 50 years later. It was at the end of this war the second blow to the two nations relationship came, as American President Theodore Roosevelt, who presided over the peace talks, did not believe that the Russians had to pay war reparations. Hey, fellow white guy, funds are kind of tight, can we just not pay? Angering the Japanese people resulting in anti-American yeah. riots, which resulted in anti-Japanese activity in the United States. Yeah, one of the things, that's the one thing that always sucks about looking at back at uh, people in history because of mod you cannot, I don't know, I, I hate the sentiment of uh, put aside your modern ideals. It's like, I, you know, I can, I can objectively look at them. I can't put away my modern ideals. I'm still not going to like them as a person. I'm going to be like, they had some good things, but also, holy shit, that's fucked up uh, from my modern ideal, ideal sense, right? Like, uh, Teddy Roosevelt supposedly was a, was kind of like, um, what's his name um came after fdr uh what was his name before before eisenhower truman uh truman and roosevelt i believe were both equal opportunist uh believers but still believed in the racial science theory that people of different races are scientifically different but they both believed in still giving equal oppor baseline equal opportunity inside of america or whatever which it's like okay you're kind of there but holy shit that's still fucked up it's also i don't know i i also like adding my uh modern moral sense because it also shows helps you really grasp get a better understanding of society at the time and how society changes um anyways that's a tangent States. 
After World War I, Japan again felt mistreated by the U.S. due to the London Naval Treaties limiting the size and numbers of their warships right as they were becoming a major player wanting to spread their influence to neighboring territories. After break And so they kept the islands anyway. Breaking from the treaty, feeling it was unfair, the Japanese began spreading said influence with public outcry from the United States denouncing it. Ignoring this, <laughs> Japan, Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931 and then China proper in 1937. By 1941, though, the Japanese had learned one of the facts of life the hard way. The China is big. And by comparison, Japan is small. And although they were winning victories, the invasion force had gotten bogged down with the Chinese Nationalist Army becoming more and more competent after just about everyone had sent advisors there, with the most recent ones being the United States also sending material. The Japanese also took parts of Indochina in a half invasion, half deal with France as one of the perks of the Axis Pact. But to do all of this, the Japanese have been heavily reliant on foreign imports for war making, most importantly oil imports from the United States that were completely stopped after the invasion of Indochina when the U.S. froze their assets, completely stopping trade, severely hindering their war making ability. One of one of the what ifs I have for World War II that I don't know if I've ever really seen anyone do um, or talk about is how would World War II look if either Japan or maybe the Axis in general had uh, inherent inside of their nation access to enough oil. Um, like, let's give them... I'm not going to give them USA-level access to oil, nor Russian access, but, like, I don't know, British access? Would that be... I mean, of course, the British access to oil comes from their foreign territories. No, fuck it. Uh, for, for sake of fun uh, and curiosity... USA and Russian levels of oil access. How would that have looked? Would that really have changed much? Who knows? Uh, because, I mean, once the British started winning the air war, the, the oil fat manufacturers would have just been bombed. So, let me know what you guys think of that what if. And this sends panic through the Japanese military, leaving them with only a couple of options to really rectify it, none of which were very good. The first was to give in to the U.S.'s demands, i.e. leave China, which was a complete <clears throat> non-starter in the ranks of the high command, as too much cost had been sunk in and it would be viewed as a defeat or surrender, something, as I'm sure you know, the Japanese were not into. The second was a strike to the north into the Soviet Union, assisting Germany. But after Nomahan, that move was seen as less than ideal. The third option was called Nanshi Ro, or the Southern Expansion Doctrine, which would be an advance into Southeast Asia, including the Philippines and beyond, to capture the resources there and bring them into the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. You have no idea how many times it took me to say that. To fuel the <laughs> empire. And I'm sure at least a few of you have been waiting for me to mention that, as it was Japan's rationale for its expansionist policy. And it is actually really interesting, but isn't entirely in the scope of this series. But you should go look it up. The problem with this was it would involve invading English, American, and Dutch colonies, which the Japanese kind of viewed as one force, and beginning war with them. So basically, to continue the war with large power China, they had to secure resources for it by beginning war with large power United States. And this yeah. is where people see the fault in this plan, and wonder how they thought it could have ever worked. The thing is, the Japanese never really thought it would work, at yep. least in the way that it turned out. In the Imperial Conference of November 5th, 1941, which I have a link to the transcript of in the description, all the big names of the Empire of Japan being present discuss how a diplomatic option is not going to work, but how risky the military option is. They were fully aware of the power of the United States, and that an attack on them provoking an all-out war would be suicidal, just as most people see it today. But that actually wasn't the plan. The Japanese saw the United States as a rather powerful, but I guess lazy, for lack of a better term, country. And I mean, it's kind of easy to see why. The war had been going on for various numbers of years, depending on when you start counting, against many of its strong allies, and it had done little more than vocalize its position and send guns. The Japanese had no intention of getting into a long, drawn-out war. They even state themselves that a protracted war with the United States would be a mistake, and hoped in one quick move to take the territories it held, along with dealing a swift blow to the Navy that would hopefully be bad enough to convince the United States to roll over and accept the changes. Because the Japanese didn't think that they would have the stomach for a long fight. With the territories taken and the Navy recovering from losses, even if the United States wanted to... F Hold on. That, here's where I, I do have a little slight problem with the Japanese here and, and how they're rationalizing this. Um, unless, of course, this ends up coming up from a, a mistake on uh, potential history side where he's trying to summarize it as best as he can, which 
no fault of his own. Um, the uh, oh, what was I saying? Um, they're like, we don't think the USA will want to fight a protracted war, but also if we get into a protracted war with the USA, we will lose. It's like, which one? Which one? <laughs> which one do you think it is? Right? Like, if you're not afraid of a protract, like if you think the USA doesn't want to fight a protracted war then i don't think you should be afraid of fighting a pro right like i don't maybe i'm just the way i'm interpreting the way things are being said here could be wrong fight it would take some My time for them to get work. back into the field needing to repair their fleet first giving the smaller japanese navy a fighting chance this however was still a very large risk and the japanese were aware of it in fact, every representative present at the meeting talks about how things would have to go absolutely perfectly on their perspective ends for this to be pulled off, as the entire plan would be a huge strain on the Japanese state, with Suzuki saying sustained war was not an option, Kai is saying it would only be possible with an increase in taxes and a widespread looting and exploitation of the conquered territories, Nagano saying that it wrote on the initial operations, and if they weren't successful, a prolonged war could not be won, and multiple statements from Sujiyama saying that it would be possible due to the poor quality of troops in the areas to be attacked, but stating once again that the war must be short. Further going on to encourage the move being made soon, as the longer they waited, the more defenses could be prepared in the areas they were planning on striking in. And although very nervous about it, this is the plan they went with. And on December 7th, 1941, a, a date, date which will live in infamy, the United States of America suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Man, I wonder if the guy who wrote FDR's script for that, a day that will forever live in infamy, man had to get fucking loaded for that one. Like, that is such a cold line. Like, it's so fucking iconic, man. <laughs> of Japan. And unlike the rest of the battles in this series, I'm not going to talk about this because it's been absolutely done to death. I yeah. think the motivation as to why it happened is a little more interesting. Yes. But basically, the Japanese always. picked the best. The why is always the most interesting reason. Yep. The why is always the most interesting part of history. Best scenario out of why multiple bad I or impossible ones it. to not lose their sunk cost in China. You don't have a better bad idea than this? This is the best bad idea we have, sir. Starting off the greatest naval war that humanity has ever seen that we'll be covering in further episodes. Before I go, though, I do want to clarify one thing. What I've just covered here is oftentimes framed as the big bad United States forced Japan into war because they wouldn't trade with them, and poor Japan was left with this only option that they didn't want to go with. And although you can see it that way, it would not be correct unless Japan was doing some kind of humanitarian mission during yeah. the conquest of China. They were in fact doing far from that, and the US's objection to their rather brutal conquest of the country is extremely justified, and limiting their war-making potential was the best thing they could have done for the Japanese territories that weren't all too fond about being invaded. Thank you to World of Warships for- And that was Pearl Harbor, the best bad option, Pacific Series Part 1 by Potential History. As always, Potential History knocks it out of the park with his way of explaining <laughs> World War II. He's just- he knows his shit real fucking well, and he know like, it's one of those things where it's like, um, a, uh, someone that knows something, um, decently well, they, they still may kind of suck at explaining it, but when someone is like, you know someone is an expert in the field, or is close to, at the very least close to, could be considered an expert in the field is when they are able to make videos on things like this kind of why and explain them really well, right? You know, that's how you know someone is really good at what they do at, at, at their, uh, and truly understands the topic that they are talking about. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.